it was a couple years ago. Andrea and I got in the truck on a date night, and we were all cleaned up, and uh, we had baby babysitter. Mom and Pa had it situation covered for us, and uh, we were headed out on a date. Does, does anybody here, is it just me, ever get in the car to go somewhere? You just want to go somewhere. You get ready, get in the car, and you're back in the driveway, and you're like, where do we want to go? Anybody else do that? Make me feel better. Anybody else? And you know, then you're like, I don't care where you want to go. Well, I don't care where you want to go. You want to eat somewhere? Where do you want to eat? We knew we were going to go out to dinner because that's what we usually do. We didn't know where we were going, so I was dressed up in my finest windsuit pants. Yeah. You're welcome. Hoodie and coaching shoes. Andrea was dressed to kill as usual. Beautiful hair, big earrings, high heel shoes. I don't know if you've noticed this, but my wife can't help but be beautiful. She can't help it. She's that pretty when she gets out of bed in the morning, I promise. No, she really, she really, she really is. I gotta get some, I gotta get some credit there. We're pulling out of the driveway. She's dressed up. I'm not, but I don't really care at this point. I have to wear a suit almost every day of my life. So when I have time for just me, I don't want to be the suit guy, right? So I wear stuff like this. She said, um, "Let's go to, let's go to Gainesboro, Tennessee. They got a place called the Bull and Thistle." I said, "I never heard of it. That sounds fine to me, honey. Wherever you want to go." We drive to Gainesboro, roll into the bull and thistle, and it don't take me very long to, to see that I'm the only cat in the house with sweatpants on. <laughs> She's beautiful, I am not. It was even more apparent that I didn't belong there when I approached the hostess at the little booth at the front and she said, sir, what time was your reservation? <laughs> Reser reservations. Um, well, let me, go, let me go check to see if we might have a place for you to sit. She goes to the back and comes out and luckily enough, we found a table that was just for us. But you wouldn't have to look far to see me in a crowd of sport coats, ties, and dresses to say, I can't believe they had a table here for you. <laughs> One of these things is not like the other. Their table wasn't made for just anybody. Neither is yours. I want to share with you this morning about a table that God has prepared for us that he shares about in Psalms 23. Psalms 23, I could preach six months on Psalm 23. There's so much truth. There's a reason it's one of your favorite verses or chapters of the Bible. I want to pick out just a nugget in verse 5 because so many of those verses man you could preach a sermon on one of those verses you could preach 10 sermons on one of those verses and I want to share one with you today from Psalms 5 23 verse 5 you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies you anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows God prepared a table just for you. It has all your favorite things on it. It has everything you could ever want at a table. And when he prepared it, he prepared a table for two. It's yours and it's his. There's something intimate about a table for two. When you go to restaurants, and you put together tables when you got several people in your party. It's always easy to pull some tables together to, to add some chairs around the table. If you've ever tried to add a third chair to a table for two, it doesn't fit. It's not big enough. And when you add the third chair, it takes away every bit of the intimacy that that table of two was meant to have. The table he created was just for you and him. Intimacy, relationship. You can't sit at a table for two directly across from that person, not look into their eyes, not see them squared up for all that they are. The reason he prepares that table for you is not because he wants to beat you with a stick or a rod. He doesn't want to condemn you. He wants to prove his love for you. Amen. That's the reason the table for two. He does it in the presence of your enemies. 
I picture the enemies are surrounded, surrounding that table for two. They're having to watch your father create this table just for you and him, but there's nothing they can do about it. They can't stop it. They can't keep him from preparing that place just for you because he's already proven that he's victorious over their power. They have no power over our God. And they're having to watch as he prepares this table for you and they also have to watch when you sit at it with your creator and you have those intimate moments where you recognize his love for you and you begin to love him back and there's nothing they can do. This table for two was only created for you and the Father. There is no place for any of your enemies at that table. He created the table in their presence, but he did not give them a seat at your table. They're not allowed to sit at the table in the presence of the Lord unless you invite them. Your enemy has no place at your table. He doesn't belong there. It wasn't created for him to have a seat. See, he had to see it because God wanted to prove to him again that he's a loser. You can see what's going on here, but there's nothing you can do to have a place at the table when God created that table for you in the presence of your enemies. That table was made specially for you and there were only two seats and it's for you and your creator. Your enemy should never have a seat at your table. But when we least expect it, he tries to pull up a chair. And sometimes we allow him, our enemy, to have a seat at the table that wasn't designed for him. You said here, the father sits there when he pulls up a chair, guess whose side he pulls it up to? Yours. He can't talk him out of anything, but he can talk you out of everything. And when he pulls up close, he starts telling you lies. They sound like this. You wouldn't believe what she said about you. When you left, you can only imagine what he did behind your back. You want some of this? Here. Man, would you look at that? Mm -mm, mm -mm -mm. You want that, don't you? He starts telling lies. He convinces you or tries to, you know, you don't really belong at this table. I got one for you. It's over there, it's in the back, dimly lit where people aren't watching. There's no light, nobody can hear or see. It's just, it's just back there, you don't, You don't belong at this table. He uses the power of suggestion. He plants a negative thought in your head. Oh, if they really cared about you, they'd have been there. If they really cared about you, they'd answer the phone when you call. If they really cared about you, they wouldn't look at you that way. See that? They don't care about you. Your wife doesn't love you. You failed as a father. Your own parents don't even love you. He uses what if. 
and he plants a seed and he uses the power of suggestion to work his way in to a place at your table. And when you start to consider those suggestions, he's got you. He's planted that seed and he's got you exactly where he wants you because now this table created for two, he's almost convinced you that he's supposed to have a seat there with you. When he sits down, he gets in your ear and he starts talking trash. The power of suggestion. He gives us a reason to be mad at the world. He tells us that we can't do it. It's too late. We'll never make it. And before long, our life starts to be spiraling and we can't put our finger on the problem. But the problem is there's an enemy at our table and we're letting him speak into our lives when God created that place for only you and him. Your shepherd is all you need at your table. A few years ago, I began running. One of my running buddies, he said, uh, you gotta go get fitted for some shoes. <laughs> I said, man, I know what size shoes I wear. He said, well, they, 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 if you go to one of those running shoe shops, they'll, they'll measure the length of your foot. They'll check to see how wide it is. They'll look at your arches. They'll watch when you walk and jog and run to see where you distribute your weight. They will come up with a pair of shoes that are exactly made just for you. Custom fit. This table the Lord has prepared for you, it is custom made to be yours. The table he creates for you, it has all your favorite things at it. It's food you like, it's fellowship you'll enjoy, it's everything you'll need to sustain you for the rest of your life. He puts everything just for you. He gives you a reason to want to come to the table. Amen. He says, you're welcome here. And it's intimate to share a meal with anybody, but especially if it's just only with one other person. Yeah. And there's a reason he created it as a table for two because he wants to have a relationship with you and he's created this table especially for you. But if your enemy has a seat he has your ear and he's going to fill it full of things to get you away from this table he tries to convince you that another table is better You see, the one who set your table, the one who prepared your table, he did it in the presence of your enemies and he came to bring you life and bring it to you in the full. The enemy that pulls up a chair as the unwanted third party, he didn't come to bring you life and bring it to the full. He came to bring you death and destruction. He came to seek and save all the things. Jesus came to seek and save. Your enemy came to destroy all of that. He came to take it away from you. He came to steal and kill and destroy. This table brings you life. When you get up and you go to the table that your enemy convinces you you should go to, it's death. There's life here, there's death there. Why do we let him sit down? at our table and start speaking death into our life. I've worked in three school districts. I've been involved in anything from beginning school as a preschooler all the way up to high school graduation and everything in between. I've seen all the goodness that comes from classrooms, hallways, cafeterias, gymnasiums, playgrounds. I've seen all the problems that all those places can bring. 
particularly more than any other area, it seems like kids get in more trouble on a school bus. <laughs> Some of you laugh because you've got stories or your kids have stories. You remember those days. Some of you may be living in them if your kid's having trouble on the bus. But with one adult driving the bus who can't leave the moving bus and steering wheel every time Johnny looks funny at Tommy, when Johnny and Tommy have a problem on the bus, the only rational thing to do is to separate them where they can't sit in the same seat. Johnny has to sit near the front. Tommy has to sit in the back, and if Tommy doesn't like it, then maybe Tommy can sit in the front, and Johnny can go to the back. I'm sorry, I'm getting sarcastic now. <laughs> but when Johnny and Tommy have a toxic relationship with each other, we don't let them sit in the same seat. It means Johnny telling Tommy, you may have a seat on this bus, but it's not with me. Sometimes you need to look back at your enemy and say, you probably can find a seat somewhere, but you're not sitting at my table. I'm tired of listening to you. I'm tired of letting you rob me of my joy, of all the good things in my life. I'm tired of the power of suggestion that convinces me people don't care about me and people don't love me and that there's nothing waiting for me at this table. I'm tired of it. Maybe you ought to go sit somewhere else. But he plants that power of suggestion, that seed in our hearts. And for some reason, once that gets in there, we wanna believe it. We wanna believe every bad thing, every lie he's filling our ear with. And we let him stay at our table. Let me tell you what happens when he gets a seat at your table. Ephesians chapter four. Verses 26 and 27. And don't sin by letting your anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And that finishes up in verse 27 that reads like this. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. Different translations say, don't give the devil a foothold. Some say, toehold. I don't know if you've ever seen any scary movies. I, I kind of like them. I probably shouldn't. My wife hates them. So I don't watch nearly as many as I used to. We go to eat the bull with this one. I wear sweatpants. Y'all know how our relationship goes. But without fail, every 1980s and 1990s scary movie has a scene of somebody running away from the bad guy and he's chasing them. How come all the bad guys are men? I don't, I'm not a fan of that. I think there should be some women bad guys. No, I'm just kidding. Every one of those movies has a scene where the bad guy is chasing the person who's trying to save their life. They come up to a wall, a fence, something they have to scale and they jump. They give it their best effort. They're trying to pull themselves over and without fail, while they're running and he's walking like this, <laughs> he catches them and what does he grab? And when he gets their foot, what does he do? Pulls them down the wall to their death. He doesn't kill them right then, he plays with them for a while and he kills them. But it started with that foothold. When the enemy pulls up a seat at your table and he starts using the power of suggestion and planting seeds in your head and you start to believe the first one, guess what he's got a hold of you? Your foot. You give him a hold on your foot and it's only a matter of time before he pulls the rest of your body down and with it. And it all started, all started. You sitting at your table with the Father. And he walks by whispers in your ear and he gets your attention.
If he has a seat, he'll have an ear. And he'll start speaking death into your life. You ever felt robbed? Dead on the inside? Like something deep inside of your soul is just eroding away like dirt after all the rain. You go to bed in darkness. You wake up in darkness. You lose hope. You laugh at the thought of phrases like things you're looking up. <laughs> Can't remember the last time you were truly happy. You recognize even in those moments, this table is yours. This table that's set with every good thing your father wants to give you, it's set and it's waiting for you, chances are you left that table and found one you thought you liked better. And if there's no joy in your life, if everybody's out to get you, if you have anger and bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart, I promise you, you're sitting at the wrong table. But you didn't start there. It started right here when he said, I wonder if they really love you. And you gave him a seat at your table. You're with me, aren't you? You know, power of suggestion the foothold in your life. You know. Maybe you can't remember where it started, but you know right now all these thoughts of self-doubt fill your mind. That say you're not good enough. You're not loved. You don't belong here. Almost, you believed them so long almost you don't really truly necessarily believe that there's anything good for you at this table either. You're like, I just don't get it. The reason he prepared a table in the presence of your enemies and didn't give them a seat is because they don't have to have one in your life. I think it's time to ask him to leave. I think it's time to kick him out of the spot where he is sucking you dry from all the life God wants to give you. I think it's time to send him back to hell, don't you? Yeah. If he's got a place in your life and he's been sitting there far too long, aren't you ready to ask him to leave? Aren't you ready to find the life that God wants to give you? Don't you believe deep inside of you that there's more? Don't you know you can wake up in the morning with hope that you can get in God's word and have hope and joy that God can give you every good thing? You know why you don't have it? Because you're sitting at the wrong table. You've listened to the lies for too long and you started to believe them and now he's got that seed planted and he's watering it and watering it and pretty soon he'll have you doing the work too because you'll start to believe what he's telling you. And it's not true. It's not true. There is freedom, there is grace, there's forgiveness, there's love and he cares enough about you that he didn't just give you a place at a really big table, he gave you a place at the table with him and it's just yours. I think it's time to come back to it. I think it's time if he's ruining your life, if he's controlling your life and your family, I think you need to ask him to leave. I want you to stand with me.